ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome again this morning uh, to City Legal. Um, we really welcome you from wherever you are joining us, um, whether you're joining us online or you're joining together with other people, uh, you're very welcome. And particularly those in here in lockdown Sydney or in Adelaide, Canberra or Melbourne. Um, my name is Mark Streeter. I'm a lawyer. I work here in the city in Sydney and uh, the city legal community exists to consider the bigger questions of life with suits and city workers in the cities right across Australia by looking at the Bible together. If you're new to city legal, uh, I want to extend to you a very special welcome. Uh, the format is a brief talk followed by a question and answer session. Now today we're experimenting with a, a new technology to provide you with the opportunity to ask questions and to post comments. You'll see in the chat uh, that John's very helpfully put in two links. One is to a Slido, which is the, the question um, page. If you click on that, it'll take you to a browser sheet and you'll see a question and answer session. And even if you don't wanna ask a question, you might see another question you're liking, you can click like, and that will vote it up the, the ranking. So we'll, we'll know that more people wanna know the answer to that question if there's more questions than what we have time to answer. Uh, there's also the opportunity to provide feedback and we very much value your feedback and your comments. So please, whether this is your first time or whether you've been here many times before, please give us your feedback and uh, give us that information there. Now we aim for your own time budgeting um, requirements to, to finish by about 8.20 a.m. Now, please um, allow me to welcome our speaker. Um, Anglican Archbishop uh, Kanishka Rafael is going to speak with us. And I want to extend a very, very warm welcome to him. Um, Kanishka, thank you. Thank you for joining us. I must feel a little bit of just personal discomfort calling you Kanishka because it's just like calling a judge by the first name. I really feel I should be saying Archbishop or Your Grace. So um, welcome this morning. Uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Streeter. Just recently, become Archbishop. Um, straight into additional challenges of lockdown. How how are you finding that? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, lovely to be with you uh, this morning. Um, well, of course, uh, you know uh, the technology that we've become so familiar with uh, means that all the paperwork and all the committee work can go on. <laughs> but um, unfortunately, I think the best part of the job, which is uh, being able to get out to the churches and uh, agencies and schools to meet people, to see how they're uh, pursuing the mission of God and to encourage them in it. I haven't been able to do that. So that, that's been disappointing, but uh, we trust that that day will come before too long. Thanks. Um, and also you, you, you're, you're gonna speak, be speaking to us in, a, in just a few minutes, but your, your, your talk is entitled uh, Stories from a Lockdown City. Um, why, why do we need this morning to, to know about that? Uh, well, I think um, the, uh, the, the effect of the pandemic um, globally, uh, as well as in our own cities, uh, recognising that um, this morning we're, uh, we're gathering across a number of cities, uh, it, ha it has caused people, I think, to, uh, to reevaluate, to think about their lives. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, I think uh, God's word has got a lot to say uh, at a moment like that um, to, uh, to challenge us uh, to uh, convict and, um, uh, uh, you know, um, and comfort us as well um, in a time of crisis. So I think uh, uh, it's a time when it's, um, it's always a good time to be looking at God's word. Uh, but I think this particular moment is speaking to us in a moment of vulnerability and openness and uh, um, uh, some disruption. And uh, so you never know what God might do in that kind of time frame. I think that's that, that I'm very much looking forward to hearing that. Now, you, you, you're speaking on a passage of the Bible from the New Testament, Matthew chapter 11, 2 to 24, and I'm, I'm about to read that. But uh, friends, if you're able to grab that, it's a, a lengthy passage. It'd be helpful if you could uh, read along uh, with me as I read that out. So Matthew 11, uh, 2 to 24. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. 
Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there is, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he is a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Thanks, Kanishna. Over to you. I think you're on mute, but let's let's see if we can unmute you. That would be helpful. Okay. Yeah, that should be good. All right. A little Great. bit. Of Thank you, Mark. What would, what, what, what would we be out with that little bit of a hitch? <laughs> it's, it's another day on Zoom, and uh, it's uh, it's it's lovely to be with you in this way. I'm sorry, I can't I can't even see you all. Um, and uh, but I am grateful for this opportunity, although I have missed out on breakfast. So uh, looking forward to um, being together again at, at Silk's Cafe. Uh, look, I guess it would be trite to say that um, this year is not unfolding in the way that we expected, uh, just as uh, last year didn't either. Whatever plans were made, whatever uh, hopes we had, um, again, they've been swept away for so many of us and virtually everywhere in the world. Uh, but I do think that in the West, especially, we've been confronted by some uncomfortable realities as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we're not as in control as we thought. We're not as independent as we thought. Uh, we can't just picture the future in our minds and bring it into being. Um, it hasn't been a bad thing to be reminded that we're not in control, uh, but it has certainly been a humbling thing. Uh, not a bad thing to be reminded that we're not God. Uh, and this isn't heaven, not a bad thing to be reminded that we're related to others uh, by necessity, uh, by duty and love. Uh, but things not turning out as we expected uh, presents a spiritual challenge as well, whether you're a skeptic or a believer. Uh, the skeptic might be caused to say, well, if nothing else, this pandemic has caused me to question what I really want out of life, whether I have directed my energies in the right area, whether the significance of relationships with others on the one hand and the huge challenge of the inner life on the other don't, after all, suggest that there might be a missing piece as I go about trying to put together uh, the puzzle of life. But for the convinced Christian, there's a challenge too, because a Christian might be saying, well, Jesus, I've thrown my lot in with you, and I thought you had my back, but I'm out of work, I'm stuck at home, I'm fighting a losing battle with despair 
and I don't entirely see the point. And that is pretty much what John the Baptist is saying when we read verse 2 of Matthew 11, that John is in prison and he sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Uh, chapter 11 introduces this theme of seeing straight, seeing right, being clear-sighted about Jesus and his kingdom. Uh, Jesus says to, his, to the disciples of John in verse 4, uh, go back and report to John what you hear and see. In verse 7, he, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 7, he says to the crowd, what did you go out to see? Uh, in the central section, verses 16 to 19, Jesus sees through the kind of cynical objections of his opponents. And in the last few verses of the passage that was read for us, Jesus unveils a terrible truth about those who've seen his miracles but failed to respond. Uh, so um, it's a passage for getting us to set our sights right. And uh, we might think first about um, seeing Jesus, verses 2 to 6. Uh, in verse 2, as I said, we're reminded that John the Baptist is in prison. He had preached that God was going to bring judgment on hypocrisy and uh, sham religion and self-serving. People had gone out to him in droves to be baptised for the forgiveness of sin and to make themselves ready for the coming of the Lord. The axe is at the root of the tree, John had said, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be thrown into the fire. Uh, a message of warning, uh, 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 an invitation to turn around, to repent, and many had gone out to John. But King Herod threw John in jail. Where's the judgment, Jesus? I said the axe was at the root of the tree, but the Roman oppressors remain in charge and I'm in prison. The self-indulgent collaborators reside at leisure in the palaces. The snake-like leaders of the temple weigh down the people with burdens they cannot bear. Are you the one, Jesus? Are you the one who's going to bring down the curtain on evil? and everything that is wrong in the world? Are you the one who is going to punish wickedness and set the world to right and set your people free? I thought it was you. And so perhaps uh, it's not too hard for us to put ourselves in John's prison cell. This isn't going the way I thought it would, Jesus. Are you the one? Well, jo Jesus says to John's disciples in verse 4, tell him what you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Now, uh, you can actually read all about that in the, the preceding chapters of Matthew's Gospel, chapters 8 to 9. Uh, the unanimous testimony of uh, contemporaneous sources at the time of Jesus, uh, written both by Christians and unbelievers, um, is that Jesus was known as a wonder worker. And these are the works that Jesus has done. But uh, Jesus is actually quoting the prophet Isaiah, speaking 750 years earlier of a time when the people would see the glory of the Lord, when the eyes of the blind would be opened and the, deer, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Only Jesus didn't finish the quote. Uh, he's quoting Isaiah chapter 35, uh, but he leaves out uh, verse 4. The prophet had said, be strong, do not fear, your God will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, he will come to save you. Jesus quotes Isaiah 35 to say to John, I'm the one. But he doesn't quote verse 4. The kingdom has come in Jesus, but not the time for judgment. He's not come in retribution and vengeance. Not yet. There is a judgment coming. Jesus will speak about that judgment in just a few verses, but it's not yet. Now is a season for seeing Jesus and aligning with him. 
Uh, now, in each of the four sections of this chapter, there's an invitation that's implied or explicit to see rightly, to get our focus right. And in verse 6, Jesus says, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Uh, the word can mean to fall away or to reject. So Jesus is saying, John, don't stumble. Don't let your circumstances blur your vision. There is a judgment coming. But now is the day of salvation. Herod, John's captor, don't misunderstand. You haven't got away with anything, and you won't. Now is the time to turn around to repent the Bible word for it and believe the good news. Christian, don't let the troubles of the world, the disappointments, the scorn and rejection of those who mock, the hardships of life in a fallen world, don't let them cloud your vision. See Jesus, the Lord who comes to save. Be strong and do not fear. Blessed is the one who does not stumble. Seeing Jesus. And then in the second section of the passage, seeing John, verses 7 to 17. Uh, Jesus has sent a message to John about his own doubts and confusion. Now Jesus speaks to the crowd about John, verse 7. What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed sweet, swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those dressed in fine clothes are in king's palaces. Jesus says to the crowd, when you went out to John, what were you looking for? What did you see? Did you expect a reed blowing in the wind, some paid megaphone, some weather vane chasing opinion pop? someone who is just going to say back to you what you already think? Or was it the man concerned and content with the accessories of prestige and power, the fine robe, the fine dining, a place in the councils of the kings? Did you go out to see a yes man, a self-promoter, a man who feathers his own nest? No, you went to see a prophet. And I tell you, more than a prophet. Jesus says, see John aright. He is the promised prophet who comes before the Lord. He's the greatest of all prophets because all who came before him spoke of one whom they did not see. But John saw the kingdom come in Jesus. And yet, Jesus says in verse 11, Whoever is least in the kingdom is greater than John. So here's the invitation. Here's the view for the one who is clear-sighted. Yes, John is in prison. Yes, verse 12, violent people raid the kingdom of heaven and subject it to violence. But see this. You who have welcomed the kingdom, you who have welcomed me, says Jesus, are greater than even than John. How so? John did not live to see the blaze of God's love in the cross of Christ. He did not see the triumph of Jesus' victory over sin and death in the resurrection. He was not a party to the pouring out of the Spirit on all God's people. He did not see in his day the kingdom advance across the globe by the preaching of the gospel. So Jesus says, the most weak and frail and stumbling Christian who has hesitatingly put their hand in the hand of Jesus is greater in the kingdom than John. Don't let John's imprisonment cloud your vision. He is the Lord's messenger, and his message concerning Jesus is true. Verse 15 says, whoever has ears, let them hear. Uh, now, there are many today uh, who want to make Jesus more like themselves. Uh, they confidently assert that he would or wouldn't do this or say that. Uh, online, you can see opinions that Jesus would or would not wear a mask that he would or would not support this policy or that politician. If you're seeking a reed blowing in the wind, then by all means, head to Twitter. 
if you want to know the truth about Jesus, look at his deeds, listen to the prophet of the Lord, who saw the fulfillment of Old Testament promises before his eyes. Jesus says in verse 15, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Seeing Jesus, seeing John, thirdly, seeing through opposition, verses 16 to 19. Uh, now, in this whole sec central section of the gospel that begins in chapter 11, uh, Jesus is engaging with his opponents, but he sees through their cynicism and hypocrisy. Verse 16, to what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For, Jesus, for John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came, eating and drinking, and they say, he is a glutton and a drunkard. The point is that the opponents of Jesus cannot be pleased. Uh, John is a rugged, wilderness prophet, abstemious, single-minded, focused on his mission to declare the word of God. He plays, if you like, a funeral dirge. What a killjoy. What a crank. He's possessed. Jesus plays the pipe of the wedding celebration. So his critics condemn him for being a glutton and a drunk. Jesus doesn't hesitate to own the name given to him by his critics, friend of tax collectors and sinners. Chapter 9 tells us Jesus had been the home of his friend Matthew, the tax collector, the author of this gospel, uh, according to all the early church fathers, and had shared the good news with those who gathered. If we play the pipe, you will not dance. If we sing a dirge, you will not mourn. In other words, Jesus is looking at the opposition that he's facing and saying, well, you're not moved to repentance by the preaching of John against sin, and you won't celebrate the presence of the Messiah, the bridegroom of Israel, the promised one. He's seeing straight through to their heart of hard, cynical, and uh, hypocritical rejection. Jesus sees through their cynical unbelief. Uh, now, there are all kinds of reasons why people don't believe in Jesus. There is a proper inquiry, proper sense uh, in which we try to answer people's genuine questions. Um, there is much that is unfamiliar in the Bible. Um, plenty of things today in this passage that we're looking at, which would be very unfamiliar uh, and uh, hard to get a hold of if you're not familiar with the Bible and the world of the Bible. And our generation is less and less familiar with the Bible. And of course, people have their own experiences in life. They want to make sense of them in light of what they learn of Jesus and what he has to say. That can take time and deserves uh, thought and consideration um, and careful listening and learning. But Jesus here exposes the hardness of heart that is, in fact, unwilling and unable to consider his claims. Nothing will suffice. Answer one question, they'll have another because they're not seeking truth. They're just trying to avoid it. But Jesus says, wisdom is proved right by her deeds. That's the clear line of sight. The words and the works of Jesus, his kingdom works of new creation and his cross work of redemption, they're the foundation of his offer. People don't fail to believe because of an absence of evidence. They refuse to believe in spite of evidence, which is the point of the last section. So seeing the end, verses 20 to 24. And people sometimes say that if Jesus were here today and performed the miracles that we read about uh, in the Gospels, then everyone would fall down and worship and believe. Uh, only the Gospels tell us that that's just not true. When people saw Jesus perform miracles right in front of them, they often hardened their hearts and refused to believe. Uh, I'll read from verse 20. <clears throat> Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed 
because they did not repent. Woe to you, Corazon. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And now what's happening here is that Jesus is criticising Jewish towns, Bethsaida, Chorazin and Capernaum, for their failure to repent, to turn to him, to trust in him, in light of the miracles that he had performed in those cities. And he contrasts those three Jewish cities with three pagan cities that were renowned for their godlessness and pride and arrogance, Tyre and Sidon, Sodom. And Jesus says, those cities would have repented if they'd seen what you've seen, but you're worse than them because you did not repent. They saw the works of God when Jesus stilled the storm and healed the blind and raised the dead, but they didn't repent. They didn't turn away from their God-denying, self-exalting ways, but they rejected both the Lord and his prophet. Woe to you, Jesus says. And now, look, there is, uh, there's no reason to think that the coronavirus is a particular judgment of God. This is what the Bible calls a fallen world. This isn't heaven. This is a world subject to decay and disease and death, a world under judgment. But God has not given us a reason to think that the coronavirus is a special judgment because of some particular sin. On the other hand, the Bible is clear that the very presence of sickness and death in the world should remind us to reflect on our response to God it would be supremely foolish to make our way through the COVID-19 pandemic without taking time personally and perhaps corporately as a society to examine ourselves and to repent of sin. Personally, we might ask, have I made plans and set goals without recognising that every day is given to me uh, as a gift from God? for the good of others and for his glory? Have I used my time, my abilities, my wealth to further my own name and interests without consideration of how these might serve God's purposes and his kingdom? Have I resented this intrusion into my plans as though God owed me something when in fact I owe him everything and he owes me nothing? In the time of COVID, have I devoted any time to serving the needs of others? Or have I only had my own needs in view? And we might like to, if we, if we were actually sitting in a room together, we might like to think about a, a kind of corporate response to this event. What should we as a culture or society repent of as a nation or a city or a church? Are we thankless? Are we prayerless? Are we neglectful of God's word? Are we indifferent to the needs of others? Are we self-serving, self-satisfied? Do we honour our leaders? Do we pray for them? Do we seek to share what we have? Do we speak for the oppressed and the widows and the orphans, the powerless and the voiceless, who through the pandemic have been even more powerless and voiceless? For those of us who are Christians, have we had any concern at all that the name of Jesus should be given the honour he is due? Do we weep over the lostness and hardness and foolishness of our own nation? Do we long for our neighbours to know the love of God, the gift of his spirit, the royal rule of Jesus? Jesus denounced the town in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. That's the clear line of sight. Blessed is the one, Jesus says, who does not reject me. Let those who have ears hear the word of the Lord's prophet. 
Wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Seek the works of the kingdom that I have done. Repent. That's the gospel window that Jesus opens. Repentance, turning. Repentance is the window that opens to the breeze of forgiveness and adoption into God's family. Not a work of our own, the gospel's work in us when by God's grace we see with clarity. When by God's grace we see Jesus. Dear friends, do you see him? Thanks very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kanishka, for bringing that um, quite difficult passage as I read it uh, to a, a greater clarity and understanding. Um, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I just invite you again to have a look at the link in the chat that will take you to the Slido um, page. Uh, there's a few questions there. And as I said, it's an opportunity, uh, even if you don't want, wish to ask a question, to vote a question up. Uh, the ranking so that we can uh, ensure that um, Kanishka can can be set, can can answer the questions, have the opportunity of addressing that in the in the very limited time we have for for questions. Um, the the first question there, Kanishka, is you spoke of a contemporaneous accounts of Jesus mm. that he was a wonder worker. Mm. Uh, can you uh, please expand? Sure. Well, of course, the uh, the primary accounts um, are, are the Gospels themselves. Uh, um, uh, Mark's gospel, I think we can say, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the earliest New Testament documents, of course, are the letters, not the gospels. The gospels are slightly later, um, uh, but certainly some of the New Testament letters by the Apostle Paul are within 15 years or so of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, uh, Mark's gospel, probably the earliest, and uh, that's probably uh, certainly within 30 years uh, of the death and resurrection of Jesus, all of the gospels completed within the first century. Um, interestingly, our understanding of this has uh, improved over time. In the 1960s, which was uh, when I was born, <laughs> in the 1960s, uh, you know, it was quite common to date John's gospel uh, after the end of the first century, 120, or, or even much later, 180, 190. That was pretty standard scholarship uh, now. Um, it's widely accepted that most of the Gospels were completed within the first century, uh, within 60 or 70 years of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and then um, uh, sources, uh, Josephus, a Jewish uh, source, Tacitus, Eutonius, uh, references, not many. Um, uh, these people were not fans of Jesus, uh, so they're, uh, they're um, uh, you know, it's not extensive, it's not pages and pages like the, uh, uh, like the New Testament itself but there are um, certainly references by Jewish and Roman um, writers uh, from that period, which, uh, of course, they don't describe to Jesus' um, deity, but they do record that he was regarded uh, in this way, regarded as a wonder worker. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. You're unmute. Yeah, I... <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, there's a couple of questions, one of which I asked, another one someone else asked. So as Jesus's cousin, would not John have been aware of Jesus's miraculous birth? And then a related question, which I asked is in Matthew 3, 16, 17, Jesus was baptized by John and saw the spirit of God descend upon Jesus like a dove and heard a voice from heaven. This is my son whom I'm well pleased. So what do we get from John asking this question now to Jesus when he's in prison? I mean, is it, is it that he didn't know or that he just wants some reassurance or how, how yeah. do you understand that? Yeah, look, I think, you know, that 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 is a great question and it's a great question to reflect on and to meditate upon because um, uh, we know very little about Jesus' childhood uh, and we don't know what John knew about it, uh, but... Um, uh, certainly, uh, their parents uh, were uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, in fellowship. They they were connected. So, uh, so we don't know exactly the pattern of that. But we do know these crucial events, like the baptism of um, Jesus, and when Jesus comes to John, you know, John is saying, "Oh, what, you know, why am I baptizing you? Shouldn't you be baptizing me?" Uh, but then 
Um, and then John uh, has this, you know, spectacularly successful ministry because he's out in the desert. People come out of the cities. We're told people come out from all over uh, to hear him. So in one sense, um, he's got lots of affirmation, uh, lots of confirmation um, that he's, in, in a sense, that he's uh, backed the right horse. And then he's thrown into prison. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Gospels record that he'll lose his life um, uh, through basically a kind of uh, domestic uh, sort of um, tension between uh, Herod and his wife, and he'll be beheaded. And what that really points to, I think, is that, uh, you know, you can have a spectacular experience of God's power, and then your personal circumstances can be so turned upside down that it makes you question this to the core of your being. It's a very important window on the life of faith because here is John, the greatest of all the prophets. Uh, by those circumstances, by his imprisonment and his impending death, really deeply confronting his own faith in Jesus. Has, has, he, has he put his trust in the wrong place? Uh, so I think it's a very, you know, I think it's a great question. Um, and, uh, and worth reflecting on. But at the very least, you'd have to say that, uh, that, that as a model of faith, we ought not to expect that faith in Jesus means plain sailing and that we never have any moments of questioning or self-doubt again. We will. But we've got Jesus' response here. Remember what you saw. And from our point of view, we've seen the cross and the resurrection as well. There's a unshakable foundation, whatever the contemporary circumstances of your own experience might be. It's an important faith point. Thank you. Uh, we will definitely run out of time with the questions that are launching in both, both on the Slido and also in the, the chat here. So another good reason why, if it's on Slido, you can vote to get the question <laughs> higher in the, in the list so I know which ones to ask next. But the next one, um, Kanishka, may be the last one. We'll see how we go. Uh, what did you, what, what, what Jesus says about people say about him and what John s sounds like confirmation bias. Why are Christians different? That is confirmation bias that the Bible is true. Um, well, uh, I, I guess we're, um, you know, we're dealing with. You, you can look at you can look at the Bible as a historical document. Okay, so you don't have to attribute to it any kind of authority uh, in order to engage with it. If you do that, then um, you know, ancient history, the study of the New Testament documents, those are academic disciplines. Uh, you can enter into them in that way. And, of course, many people do. Uh, you know, there are New Testament scholars who are Jewish and who are atheists and so on. So it isn't um, kind of... Uh, uh, it is possible to do that. In order to answer the question, um, uh, is this a reliable account of the things that it is describing? Now, the question about what kind of impact that has on you personally it is actually a spiritual question. So, um, uh, you know, I, uh, my own experience of reading the Bible was that I found it compelling and engaging, uh, but then undoubtedly there was something which at the time I couldn't have explained, but which now I would say was the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that God actually uh, made me, um, well, repent, uh, that uh, Jesus ceased to be merely a character in the story, merely a figure from history, but in a personal way, uh, a Lord and Saviour. Um, and, and that's inescapable, because unless you have that kind of personal conviction, um, your faith would only be, uh, um, if you like, routine uh, or habit or nominal, we might say. Um, personal conviction comes from God, and that's what we believe. But we believe that God does this as people read the Bible. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kanisha. We're mindful of time, and there are a number of still questions to go, but I guess um, we'll keep us coming back for next uh, time to have more of our questions addressed. 
<laughs> uh, I really do appreciate you uh, carving out the time in your busy schedule to come and speak to us. Now, um, friends, uh, on the chat, there is a link to provide feedback and we very much value your feedback. Please click on that link that John's very helpfully hyperlinked for us so that we can uh, hear your comments and uh, opportunities to improve uh, City Legal. Uh, in two weeks time, we continue our term three City Legal program with uh, David Robertson uh, speaking to us. Uh, and then a fortnight after that, Danny Mullins, and then a fortnight after that, uh, David Robertson again, uh, speaking on the series uh, Servant uh, Leadership. Uh, friends, I really thank you again for joining us this early morning. Uh, thank you again for providing us with uh, feedback and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you and your friends and colleagues uh, in two weeks time. Thanks very much.